Aloha, Packers fans, and welcome back to the Ohana Packers Edition podcast. I am Mike Kawano, joined as always by Iowa Joe. Joe, we stand on the precipice of both a new season and the new era of Packers football. Joe, what are your hopes for the new season? Do you feel flushed with new hope? Well, like I've always tell, told people so far this offseason, ever since the Rodgers trade, I, I, I'm i more excited about this year than I have been for a long time, just because it's such a... a uh, Blank canvas, you, right? Pretty much, because, you know, before with the Rodgers situation, it was, okay, well, you know, we're at least going to win this many games, and we're going to at least have a shot. Well, well now with uh, Jordan Love, we don't know. I mean, he's he's looked good and all that, but you know, it just it, it's going to be one of those things that we don't know what's going to happen. And I, I know we're going to be talking about the schedule here in a little bit. And I was trying to do my my schedule predictions, and it was so rough because it's like, well, you know, I could see him winning this game, but I could also see them losing because of this, this, and this, and this. So it, I, you know, I've changed my answers like a dozen different times on that. So it, it is, it's really an unknown. And I think that's why it makes it more exciting. Definitely. Yeah. Just like you said, the different level of expectations that's coming into the season compared to really, you know, obviously 2019 to 21, 2019, they had reloaded 20 and 21. They were viewed as one of the top if not the top team in the nfl going into the season and even last year you still had rogers so this year you know there's the unknown of what is love gonna be like you said joe we've seen good things in the preseason but there's still it's still kind of like bowling with the bumpers up kind of thing and now the the bumpers are coming down for the regular season it's as they say in the military it's live fire now and stuff but it's like you said, it it does bring a different kind of excitement and a different jolt to this fan base. And we're kind of, I, I think we're both on the same page that we're looking forward to that. But diving into where we stand with the team now, the 53-man is final, finalized. Um, the team released its initial 53-man on Tuesday, um, but then immediately within the first 24 hours due to waiver claims, um, a couple other moves, you know, they did adjust and release some guys and to make room for the waiver claims. But um, Joe, off the bat, what was the, th- what was the thing that surprised you most about what ended up being the 53-man roster? To take a page out of Jerry Seinfeld, Newman. I, I just, I still can't believe how that guy has a friggin' roster spot. I, and I've been arguing with people for the past, what, this is Friday. They did final cuts on Tuesday. So the past three days about the whole Newman thing. Oh, well, you know, he's, he's got ability to be guard and a tackle. And it's like, yeah, but we don't need that. We already have guys who can switch from tackle to guard if need be. We needed a guy who can go from guard to center, and we kind of had that with that. Uh, and I'm going to butcher his name, James Hansen. Impey. Oh, no, Impey, yeah, He's yeah. Squad, yeah. Hanson, I, I don't think was ever going to do it just because he was kind of like a Newman, where he just he showed ability in certain aspects, but couldn't do it in an all around aspect. But yeah, MP came back on uh, practice squad, but I- I'm really surprised. I, I-, I want to say somebody put up a stat that out of like 23 snaps or something, MP allowed zero pressure. And I think he has the ability to work inside and work at the guard spots and the center position. So he's a little bit more valuable than what Royce Newman is, but somehow that guy just keeps getting a roster spot. And I, I just, I don't, I, I don't understand it, but I, I think uh, other than that, just being that we are now once again, one of the youngest teams in the league, if not the youngest team in the league. And it's so weird to say that now, because if you remember back in the heyday of the Rogers era in the first, we were always the youngest team in the league. Then we kind of got too old, and now we're back to being one of the youngest teams in the league. So it's really amazing how, you know, to use the phrase "time is a flat circle," where it just it 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 
comes back around to where now it just up and down, up and down. So it, it yeah, that that's yeah. where I'm at. Yeah, I think I think it is just a function of you know you we say it all the time with love where it's the whole okay there's these young receivers young tight ends and you're hoping that he grows up with this core of players you're gonna have the it's funny to say that Bakhtiari is now the oldest player and he's younger than both of us yeah um, you know <laughs> coming off of the last couple of years where you had Crosby Rogers a bunch of guys who were hanging up, you know, they were the uh, curve setters <laughs> in, in terms of the, the roster age. And now, yeah, you have Bakhtiari at 31. I think yeah. when they cut O'Donnell, there might be like one or two other 30 year olds on the roster and that's it. Uh, Maybe someone Preston. is turning Preston. I think it's Preston and Campbell. If they're not 30, they're turning 30 this season. And then that's kind of it. And, um, yeah, so like you said, it's 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 neat to kind of be back at this point where we're the youngest team in the league, and not just young because they've like had to cut and gut the roster. There's actual talent. That's something that we talked about with Perone last week. Is that it's not just a young team. There there is there are a lot of bright spots on this roster and a lot of reasons to be excited to see guys get opportunities that they might not have gotten because the team was going for. Uh, championship aspirations in years past kind of thing and stuff so it, it's definitely um one of the bright spots and yeah the newman thing we we've heard different explanations as to why he made it and you, the big one that everyone says is that they they're tackle heavy and they don't have enough guards but i don't know my my biggest thing with newman is that he is the same guy he was the day he stepped into 1265 you know lum Lombardi way and it it just you know he had ex, he had issues as a rookie that you're like okay it's fine you know those are things that rookies struggle with and hopefully with some coaching and he's still making the same mistakes there's plays where you know, Sean Ryan was getting highlighted for a good block and on the other side of the line it's still Royce Newman not knowing if he's supposed to double team or if he's supposed to go up field kind of thing and stuff and it's like dude you were doing that two years ago and you're still yeah. making the same mistake and it it just as as um as um what's it called blades of glory said will ferrell said in blades of glory it's mind bottling i it's my mind is definitely in a bottle and i can't get out of it and it it just we just can throw our hands up in the air and say whatever and all i can hope is that they draft someone better than him to kick him off the roster next season that's Really, that's what they've kind of shown, you know, Goody has kind of shown is it's like he'll be loyal to his picks. But once he does pick up someone in the draft that, you know, is better, he will kick you to the curb kind of thing and but stuff. But and- then again, he's not because you look at some of the other guys that he's cut, you know, Shamar Jean Charles cut, didn't come back. Uh, Grant DeBose cut, but he's on the practice squad, you know. As much as he does show loyalty to draft picks, he also is cutthroat where, you know, you know, if you're not going to make it. So that's why this Newman thing is still so mind boggling. You know, like I said, it's more like I said, it's more in the sense of he hasn't drafted enough guys to take his spot necessarily. He's he's picked up tackles kind of thing. But like Shamar, John Charles, um, it's Valentine. You know, Valentine is the guy who took his roster spot kind of thing. And DuBose was injured and couldn't beat out Toure kind of thing. And that's kind of... Well, no, I, yeah. I get that. But it, yeah. it, it it also goes to show that he knows he can, you know, it shows that he can move on and not have an issue. But then he'll keep certain guys forever. And it just, I, I don't get it, but... Yeah. Well, his predecessor, Ted Thompson, rest in peace, Ted. He had that issue with certain guys too. So I, I do think it is, we, we joke about it in NFL circles where it's like every team looks at certain guys and it's like, we've seen, we've seen the good and we just need to get him there. But I think we're both at the point where Newman is one of those, he's not going to be that guy. So, And yeah. I, I could have understood keeping him if he would have became the cut to re- you know, uh, to bring somebody back or whatever, but right. he he's still on the team, and I, yeah. I feel sorry for Jordan if 
Newman ever has to get into the game because that's he's going to be running for his life. Luckily, it looks like Ryan is ahead of him on the depth chart, but yeah. But that's that's a topic for a deeper day. My pleasant surprise was Emmanuel Wilson had done enough to make the 53 man. I I thought they were going to run into the season with two running backs and possibly add someone off of um, you know, off of waiver claims, um, but you know, keep uh, some number of um Taylor Wilson, Goodson on the practice squad and use them kind of as um, firefighter running backs to where, you know, you can call them up for the, the, what was the COVID call-ups, but now they're just practice squad game day actives. And then if you do need a third running back, you can either elevate one of those guys to the roster or sign someone off the street. So it's always great to, when you have a a great story like Wilson is, who can kind of scratch himself off the mat in terms of being a lowly div two star and bring himself into um, notoriety to make a, you know, open day, opening day roster. Um, it's always fun to see those kind of stories play out. And then just the fact that they, they thought enough of enough guys to keep 11 old linemen on the starting roster. Like you said, Tanuda ended up going on IR, but normally they keep eight or nine. And just to see him go not to 10, but 11 was a little bit of an eye opener, but that's kind of the, the roster calculus that a lot of front offices go through and it'll be interesting to see um you know who's going to be that like you said joe they're going to be moving gudekunst has shown he will churn the bottom of the roster and so it'll be interesting to see who's kind of next to go (laughs) for lack of a nicer way to put it to um open up a spot if a better name does come up on uh the waiver wire or anything like that wilson (laughs) I Wilson was a good story. There's no doubt about it, but I think it was also, how do I want to put this? It was also a, he lucked into it. I don't doubt that. I think your guy had a leg up. I I am not going to sugarcoat that. I I do think he did. Well, and, and I really think, yeah, Tyler Goodson's shoulder injury really, you know, cut him down, but you also had Lou Nichols who, ended up with an injury and stuff like that to where it got to be where now we've got Lewis, we've got Taylor battling, and then we've got guys we just picked up like a week ago. And it, so it really came down to, okay, well, do we stick with Taylor who is just a guy or do we get the guy that potentially showed enough in the preseason that, if we need to call on him, he could be that surprise home run hitting type guy. And I think he, you know, the big, con- and I understand it, but it also fr- frustrates me. Oh, well, you know, that third running back needs to be proficient with pass protection and needs to be this. Well, no, not really. I mean, it'd be great for it, but really what you're thinking is your third guy is going to be the guy who steps up if there's an injury. And, and yeah, he's got to be able to pass protect a little bit, but that doesn't have to be his specialty. You want a guy who, if Aaron Jones goes down or A.J. Dillon goes down, can step in and make plays for you. I, I mean, if you want a pass pro, get a guy like Brandon Jackson back during the Super Bowl run. Guy couldn't run the ball to save his life, but he could pass protect and catch out of the backfield all the time. But look at what that did to us. We had no run game. So, you know, that was the years that Aaron Rodgers was our leading rusher every year. And so, yeah, while it's great to have, you still want a guy that can play. Taylor, I, I mean, I understand what he is. He's just a guy. He's not never going to be this amazing player, but he's going to do just enough to get you by if you need it. But I think with Emmanuel Lewis, with Lewis, Emmanuel Wilson, uh, he showed enough that maybe he could be that playmaker if it comes down to it or that change of pace guy because Aaron Jones has decent enough speed. A.J. Dillon's really not your speed guy, but Emmanuel Wilson looks like he could be your home run hitter. And, you know, maybe you could start working with him in that Tyler Irvin type role 
where you start doing some jet sweeps with them. You start doing some, uh, you know, screen passes with them, stuff like that. But again, to keep three, it doesn't always mean he has to be proficient at certain aspects. He just needs to be that type of guy that's going to make the plays. So I, I, I was happy for him, although I, I do wish. I, I think it kind of sucks the way they it worked with Tyler Goodson. I'm hoping once the four weeks is up, they can and he, and if he doesn't get picked up by somebody else, maybe they'll bring him back to the practice squad because I think before the shoulder injury, he was really making a name for himself. And I and I know that's going to be biased because I'm a Hawkeye fan, whatever. But I think you were hearing more about him this year with some of the stuff that he was doing. So I and then uh, Lou Nichols, it kind of sucks seeing a uh, even though he was a late round draft pick, seeing a draft pick get cut loose like that, and not be brought back because he was waived injured so again he's got to wait the four weeks but just like newman i think taylor needs to be just off the i mean we're at year four with him and he's really not shown anything to justify keeping him as much as they do or continue to keep him as a guy they bring up from the practice squad or whatever so i i think it's time to just cut your cut your time with them and move on to somebody else. And the 11 0 lineman is that, you know, it goes back to the whole Newman thing. It's, there were other guys that I thought that they should have kept, but you know, the, this Gutekind seems really high on Tenuta or however you pronounce his name. And so that was an obvious move to bring him back when they could. Uh, and the other guys, I, I did see the rumor that they were looking to maybe move Yosh uh, or Yosh. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of surprising in a way. But then again, it's not because that just shows they're, they're really liking what Rashid Walker was doing. And so, and they've been big on Caleb Jones. So I... And with Yash only on a one-year uh, contract, it, it really – I i know why they didn't move him because they probably weren't getting offers that were going to be better than maybe a comp pick they were going to get for him next year. But it still is a little bit interesting that they did throw him up on the trade block. I'm surprised somebody didn't bite for him specifically a New York team that has a quarterback that used to play for the Packers just because their offensive line is just horrible right now. But other than that, there was really no surprise guys on the offensive line other than, you know, Newman for MP or whatever, but nothing really there surprised me. I, I knew they were going to keep at least 10 just because it was justified the 11th was not overly surprising in a way just because of how they maneuvered it after uh, the final or the roster became official and put Tenuta on IR. But other than that, nothing really surprised me in that aspect. Yeah, kind of going back to your Patrick Taylor point, I, I think what – I don't know if Emmanuel Wilson would have gotten claimed on waivers, but I think they looked at it where it came down to the point where they were like, we've had so many injuries at running back. We do need to hedge for in case. And Jones and um, Dylan have run into injury issues in the past. But and so they were kind of like, okay, we probably should keep a third guy, like you said. And then they probably looked at Taylor and Wilson, and it's like, okay, Taylor is, like you said, so vanilla <laughs> that no one is going to claim him if we cut him. And especially because Goodson is down, Nichols is down. We'll just cut him, gamble that he's 99% likely to make it through waivers and he'll come back to the practice squad kind of thing. And he'll be there as our binky, so to speak, in right. case of emergency. And Wilson will be on roster. And like you said, he definitely has more upside in terms of what he could become. Like you said, I think Taylor is basically a finished project product at this point. So 
you know what he is. He's solid but unspectacular. Um, I would come into like Tony Fisher from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, he he was kind of around because he was Mister Reliable. But um, other than that, there you, no one wanted to see him on in an important down over Aman or even Najee kind of thing. So I, I do think Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do think that made it I, I think I'm more just surprised they kept the third running back but I, I think looking at it with a few more days it does make a lot of sense to carry a third running back it, especially with how much they're likely to lean on Jones and Taylor to start the season um, the practice squad is set Green Bay did keep their um, international uh, practice practice player in Kenneth Odumegu. Um, he got some limited snaps, but he is big and athletic, so there's potential there. Um, you know, keep him around, see what a keeping him in an NFL room, NFL conditioning and strength program does for him. And the only one I care about is they brought Grant Dubose back to the practice squad. <laughs> um just I, I do think he's got some upside, but like Lou Nichols, you know, he's an incoming draft pick who missed a bunch of time in the preseason due to injury. And so they get another crack at watch. You know, it was hard for him to make the roster over a bunch of guys who were either established or making more plays in the preseason. My guy who fits the role of guy who they can't quit is Bo Melton. I don't get it. <laughs> I feel like they've filled the role he could fill on the roster. Uh, but Eh, he's a practice squad player. That's kind of my attitude for most of the guys on there. Joe, anyone who made it that you have some hopeful upside to or um, kind of nothing much so far on the practice squad otherwise? Well, with the practice squad, I I like a lot of the guys that they brought back. I mean, they all make sense. Magoo, uh, Impy, DeBose... Austin Allen, Keyshawn Banks, those guys, even Henry Pearson and Benny Sapp. Benny Sapp is probably my favorite out of there because it seemed like he was really starting to pick up in that last preseason game. Uh, Odumagu is not surprising just because he's going to be an exemption for two years. So, I, you know, it would be really stupid of Brian Gutekunst to like cut ties with them completely when you're going to keep them as a free roster, you know, addition, no matter what. Uh, other than that, I, there was the only surprising couple of things was cutting Tariq Carpenter and Jonathan Ford without trying to bring them back to the roster, to the practice squad. I, I mean, I think I would rather have Jonathan Ford than a Chris Slayton and maybe a Tariq Carpenter more than a Corey Ballantyne. Maybe in my view, because Tariq looked like he was really starting to come on. Again, like I, like I just said with Benny Sapp, really looked like he was fitting the uh, his transition to the new position well. He was playing well on special teams. He got quite a bit of pressure on when he was rushing the quarterback during uh, the Seattle game. Matter of fact, the Seattle game was on again last night, and I kind of was just watching it through. And the first, and when I flipped it on, it was you know it was Tariq making two or three different plays. So that it, it doesn't mean that they're not going to bring him back here in the next few days, but it just it was surprising that they didn't, you know especially Jonathan Ford, because again, Ford was another one that looked like he was really doing well. And Matt LaFleur even was talking about him bringing his name up specifically. And to me, the Packers only have the one true nose tackle in TJ Slayton. And Jonathan Ford was the only other one that could possibly be considered that true nose and now you've only got one nose tackle. I don't think Slayton's that nose tackle. I think he's more the end. Kenny Clark, uh, I love him. Great guy. Great player. But he needs to be set up more as an end than a nose tackle just so he can feast. And now with only Slayton as your nose, Kenny's going to be relied upon to play that uh, that other nose position 
when Slayton is taken out. And I, I think you're taking you, – you're, you're hamstringing Kenny by doing that. So Jonathan Ford is a big surprise to me on not being brought back. Otherwise, Patrick Taylor again, you know, I understand it, old, reliable, whatever. But other than that, there's nobody really surprising, and I, I can understand them all. I mean, Magoo is surprising in a little bit that, I, well, I guess they play their seasons opposite to what the NFL does. It wouldn't surprise me if Magoo goes back to the XFL or something. Uh, just to get more playing time. But I guess he's already 27 years old. So, you know, if, if he can stick around on the NFL roster, he's going to stick around on the NFL roster. Uh, other than that, Ennis Gaines. Uh, sorry, my telephone is going off. Of I'm so unprofessional right now. Uh, Bo Melton, I understand. They were really in love with him last year just because of his his athletic profile. Uh, so, but yeah, other than that, that's all I know. That's all I got on. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing for me is that they didn't bring in a kicker. Like I know they've done that the past few years to kind of have an emergency guy on stuff. I guess that does point to, it was more COVID and more Crosby is old than it is something that they necessarily are going to do every year. So, Well, in a way, yes, but in a way, no, I think it also, you got a kicker right now that's in his own head. And if you bring in that other guy, it you don't know what's going to happen with him. I, I, I keep pointing this out with Anders that it seems like when he can focus on his task and he can do it, I, I know it doesn't count in the official record books, but he kicked the third longest field goal at Lambeau. Third longest, 57 yards. He's got the leg, he's got the ability, but I think his own head, he gets in his own head. So until he can feel more comfortable, I don't think they're going to bring that extra kicker in. I understand what you're saying, and I would have loved for them to bring in another guy, but I think right now, just to get him work, just to get him more comfortable, they're going to hold off. I am surprised they didn't bring a punter. You know, and we need to talk about that for a minute that, you know, Jason Perrone, other than being really, really ridiculously good looking, also in his own way is a bit of a genius because he pretty much nailed it that Pat O'Donnell was going to get cut and Whelan was going to win the spot. I'm surprised they didn't bring in another punter for the practice squad just in case. Because we all know that we, we've had this happen before. Corey Bajorquez comes to mind where a tremendous punter, great leg, could nail it. But then the weather changed and it all went away. And it would be nice for them to bring a guy in just in case Whelan starts to go south. That way you're not having to hunt a guy down. You've already got a guy in the... In the uh, organization that can step up and get right in there without having to go through a bunch of things. But other than that, I, I get what you're saying, but it's really not a surprise to me knowing what we know right now with Anders that, that they didn't uh, bring another guy in. No, that's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> got a got a foster, foster belief and good vibes for Anders. But like you said, the last time he was on the field, he nailed him. And that 57-yarder had hair from like 60 or so or longer. It, it, it was That kick was zooming. But we've got the roster set just like the Packers do. Joe, let's move on to that regular season. And... Yeah, this one's rough because I, <laughs> I, I, I really, theoretically, if you look through our schedule this year, it – it it's winnable. I mean, it's winnable to the point where they could go 13 and four and not bat an eye. It's all just going to depend on how all the young players get to, you know, start meshing together and, you know, the injury situations. Cause you know, we're going to suffer a few injuries here or there, no matter what it's the NFL, you know, what they say that, uh, 
the average NFL lineman or NFL player suffers enough hits as like 36 car wrecks or something like that. So, you know, there's going to be injuries. There's going to be whatever. But really, I – and I know Mike's guy <laughs> – I'm looking at his – his uh overall prediction and it's not looking great but i just i'd have to sit here and count mine real quick but i and i've said this before i I, i've said this with jacob westendorf i said this with a lot of other guys this team could either be three and 14 or 13 and four because that's just how this team is put together right now that that and we don't know but yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting season for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to tally mine, so go ahead and talk, Mike. Yeah, so my record ended up at nine and eight, and it's like Joe and I were talking about before we started recording, where it's just hard to pin down because there's so many things that could go right or could go wrong this season. That's that's one of the that's one of the um the factors with all the youth on the roster is that there are a lot of variables, unknowns, whatever you want to call them. And Joe is putting his total up right now. And yeah, he's got the Packers winning 11 games. So they would be sitting at 11 and six on the season. I could, you know, I'm at nine and eight. There's a bunch of games where I sat there for a decent five minutes at a time. It's like looking at your Scantron test from high school where you're going, is it A? Is it B? Do, do I continue with the Christmas tree? Do I, do I move on? Do I leave it? It's, it's just, there's some what I feel like should be no brainers on the schedule. And there's some where, yeah, we'll get to um, where you're just kind of like, there's this factor, this factor. They could be good by then because it's later in the season. But like you said, Joe injuries, Anders becomes Anders again. <laughs> um, Love can't adjust back to the league when the league starts to throw him curveballs, kind of thing. You know, he love turns out to be Pedro Serrano can't hit the curveball. It, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But week one, my note is just lol. Because yeah, right. <laughs> my, my biggest concern is just Perone, you know, Jason Magnum Perone kind of said it last week. Does Chicago just throw the kitchen sink? They probably should, honestly, because it's week one, not a lot, you know, we can, you can scout because it's a like opponent, but there's been a lot of roster turnover on the two teams kind of thing. So yeah, Chicago is probably going to try to throw the kitchen sink. We've seen Lafleur play it kind of closer to the vest, but we'll see, you know, that was with Rogers at the helm. We'll see if that kind of holds with love it, you know, love in the bot, love under center. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to see what, what, LaFleur rolls out for love in week one. I think that's the part that I'm most excited for. And on defense, I just want to see them play discipline discipline. That should be that, you know, if there's a if there's a key word for each side of the ball, defense, it should be discipline because it's right. gonna be it's gonna be expect that there's gonna be a lot of, you know, whether it's a flea flicker that we saw in Chicago last season or um field, you know, running the op the read option, things like that. Guys just have to be disciplined and stick to their keys, stick to their reads. And because that's the thing with teams throwing the kitchen sink with trick plays is they're going to run out of them at some point. And you got to just limit the damage as much as you can. And whether, as they always say, whether the storm, whether the early, um, the early emotions, momentum swings, and then the talent, you know, as long as you don't make too many mistakes, the talent is going to win out eventually. And it's just a matter of, there being enough time on the clock for Green Bay to Green Bay's talent um, disparity to to show against what Chicago's roster is, um, certain media members have given them twelve wins. That's hard to go from three wins to twelve wins in a season yeah. when you haven't fixed a lot of the issues on your roster. To me, it's a lull because Green Bay's strengths are still what Chicago's weaknesses are, especially with Tevin Jenkins, who's probably arguably their best lineman going on IR already. And yeah, Green Bay just has to play smart, disciplined football in my eye, and it should be a win in week one. Yeah, I don't see how it can't be a win at this point. The only way that it is is if Justin Fields goes off on Jalen Hurts level uh, play and runs for 165 yards and three touchdowns and whatever. 
because I, like I keep saying, he's just a glorified running back in my opinion. I, I you know, Jair's going to pretty much cover DJ Moore. Uh, I think Kwano could probably go out and cover Cl- Chase Claypool at this point, just because it could hit him right in the chest and he's probably going to drop it. Uh, so, I mean, I, this defense should hold up. If we see anything from them in the first game, like we saw in the preseason, it, there's no doubt that, especially with Chicago's O line being, you know, pretty shite right now, that it it just there's no reason that they won't be able to get to them. The big question is whether or not the offense is going to start clicking. You know, obviously Jordan's looking good in the preseason. You know, he's looking more confident. It and the weather. Let's face it. I, I don't know what the weather's going to be. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say week one in Chicago last year was that monsoon that San Fran couldn't deal with last year. So, yeah, yeah. And, and and if it's a favorable weather, I would love to see them come out and just do like they did in Minnesota week one last year and and let Watson just fly down the field and you know hit him open and hopefully this time he holds on to it and you know whatever i i would love to see that just to come out and say hey we're not afraid of you guys and if they can do that and if they hit it i think that's going to give them a confident boost just to go through and you know win the game yeah absolutely i and i think it's it's good for the whole season too to put that on film to hit a big play because it's you know everyone's thinking Green Bay is going to lean on their two running backs which is one of the best if not the best backfields in the league you come out and you start you know you don't have to huck it deep every play but you hit you connect on a couple deep shots you kind of send that message to the rest of the league that oh okay Green Bay is looking to go deep early kind of thing and stuff. So we can't just load the box every time and stuff like that. Well, and they it, it, didn't really show it in the preseason. So that makes me think yeah. that the first play that, you know, that first drive, they're going to come out and try to hit the home run right off the bat just because yeah, he did throw a couple of them in the preseason, but there wasn't a lot of them. It was more, right. it was a very vanilla type offense in a way, just because I, I know they're not going to show their hand fully. So just to come out, let Watson blaze speed down the field and let love hit him wide open. I, I just that would be a beautiful way to start the season. Of course, now we've jinxed it and it's going to be a play action screenplay to Aaron Jones, but that's the right. Here nor there. <laughs> All right. Moving on to week two. Uh, and then obviously we kind of noted it, but week one is at Chicago. Week two is at Atlanta. So Green Bay opening up with two road games on the season. We we both also have this one marked up as a win. <laughs> My notes are I'm not a believer in um, Ritter as a quarterback for Atlanta, but they do have the weapons on offense to make this one interesting. Um, I'm not a fan of their O-line, so it's kind of same thing with what we were saying about Chicago, where if the pass rush we saw in the preseason is legit, especially on, you know, Atlanta's in a dome on turf kind of thing, that pass rush should be able to rev up. Um, and it's just a matter of, like I said, ke- keeping the bases covered. You'd like to hope that Jair can um, do his magic on, um, oh shoot, what's that receiver that everyone wanted Green Bay to draft last Drake year? Drake London. Oh, Drake London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So that, yeah, there's a height advantage, but keep the pressure on them. I- I'm seeing that as a pretty good one for Green Bay too. I know it's two road games and there's a lot of things that go into you know, first time starting quarterback starting on the road. But the funny thing is, is that loves really his longest playing times are all road games. You know, he has the start in Kansas city, the fourth quarter in Philly. And then um, the, sorry, that was the fourth quarter in Philly was last year, but then the, in 21, he had the start in Kansas city and that he played basically three quarters in Detroit. So he's, actually played on the road more than he has at home at this point so maybe he is kind of just used to playing on the road at this point and that would be a nice thing to have in his you know a nice feather to have in his cap at that point i just really didn't see anything with atlanta to say that the to let it go either way 
I, so I, I went with the win just because I really didn't see anything that scared me with Atlanta per se. I mean, they've got weapons down there. There's no doubt about it. Kyle Pitts and Drake London and, and uh, Bajon Robinson. So I suppose if Bajon just goes off, the, there's a chance. But I just it doesn't scare me. So I, I went with the W on that one. Yeah, it'll be a good test because um, Atlanta, Arthur Smith is still the coach, I think. So it'll be a good test in terms of there's going to be a lot of similarities to what Green Bay wants to do on offense that Atlanta right. is trying to do on offense. So it, it'll be a good um, it'll be a good test for the defense. Um, and just like you said, um, in terms of Chicago, just want to see the offense continue to gain or maintain traction depending on how they do in week one um and then we move on to week three the home opener versus new orleans and this is where we have our first split in the road um iowa joe has this one as a win i have this one as a loss this is one of my ones where i'm i was i was waffling on this one a lot just because new orleans isn't the new orleans team from even two years ago but at the same time they still have enough playmakers on both sides of the ball that they do kind of make my eye twitch a little bit. Um, who knows if Michael Thomas will play that game, but um, I think between their offense having enough playmakers and their defense having enough talent to really give Love a test, it'll be interesting to see um, what plays out in Lambo that day, but We'll kind of see. I, I think that'll only be James's like second trip to Lambeau, and he didn't have a great first one. But Joe, Point what has you... uh, It's not James going to be starting. It's Derek Carr. Oh shoot, that's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, good. He'll fumble it out of the end zone again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I waffled back and forth on this one, just because of the Derek Carr thing. I just, with it being the first game at Lambeau of the uh, of the season, I couldn't put it as a loss. I, I had to put it as a win just because I, I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I Like I said, I waffled back. I was 50-50 on it, and I kind of went more with a win just because I didn't want us to keep looking the same all the way through. Uh, but I, I do think there is more of a chance for the win. Just, I, I think if I remember right, New Orleans's offensive line is kind of not the best in the world. They still do have playmakers. I think Kamara is out for this game. Yes, he will be out. This will be either the last or second to last game he's serving his suspension for. So yeah. So that is a big one. You're right. Yeah. We won't have to worry about him too much. Their defense, yeah, it, it, it's it's a good defense, but it could come down to a defensive battle. I, I just think the Packers will, you know, probably eke by on it. I just, I, I, I don't see how they could lose the first one of the, especially after getting spanked by New Orleans, you know, a couple of years ago in the opener. I, the, I don't see them taking the loss on that one you're right like i said mine was kind of that way too where i was waffling on it and kind of just came up tails in terms of my final look at it and stuff but you know it'll be love's first start you know it'll be his first official home start and there's oh it'll be and that's where i was kind of like it could go really well or I don't want to say the moment will be too big for him, but just the like the pressure. It's a different kind of pressure to have your first home start, right? Um, you know they're gonna every every time he won't hear it on the field, but you know the broadcast every time he does it. Yeah, Rogers got the fans up like that every time too. You know we're gonna yeah. hear that nonstop for that New Orleans game, but um, I think you're right. I think it's gonna be a close game. This is one of those ones though where because I have it as a potentially close game. All the little nitty gritty factors. Will love make mistakes? Will Anders become Anders? Will some will a safety blow a coverage kind of thing and stuff? That's kind of where I had it leaning that way. And um, but yeah, we're, we're we were splitting hairs on this one. And this is one of those games. Like I said before, we started off our projection. 
I have no problems with it swinging either way at this point right. in time, with, especially without seeing what the team is really going to look like for a week or two. It, it was just too hard to kind of pick because there's too many unknowns at this point. But I can feel good either way about saying it, either way being a win or a loss. Or I should say, I don't have a lot of, of heavy footing. It, it won't hurt my feelings if someone says like, oh, I have it as a win kind of thing and you had right, it as a yeah. loss. Yeah. Detroit, week four. I have this one as a loss because I do believe in a lot of what Detroit has set up for them. And to me, this is the first strap up your jockstrap game for this team on the season. Detroit, you know, neither of the Detroit wins or Green Bay losses were pretty. <laughs> they were both just slugfests and Detroit clawed its way out on both of them. And to me, that's where I want to see if Green Bay will be mentally tough enough to take this game from Detroit kind of thing. I know it's at home, but Green Bay had everything on the line to close the season. I know it's a different roster, different quarterback, but a lot of the other main players are still on these on this roster. And that's why I have it as a loss is because I don't know where their head's going to be at going into this game, but it would be a great win if they get it because you kind of reset the narrative on, you know, like I said, it's your first matchup against a tough, tough team. And if they win this one, I'll feel a lot better about a bunch of the other games coming up off on the schedule after it. I put them as a win just because it's another one. I kind of waffled back and forth on, uh, but either way, I don't see them losing back to back games at home. And so it, if, if I went New Orleans as a loss, Detroit it becomes an automatic W because I don't see them losing back to back. Detroit, I've loved what Detroit's been doing. I and you know they're 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 building a solid foundation over there, but they still have the same kind of situation the Packers do right now, where they're a really young team. So they're still kind of building on their stuff and a lot of it's going to come down to like the Packers, the quarterback play is Jared Goff going to be Jared Goff of last year, or is Jared Goff going to be Jared Goff of the past? So uh, it, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. I mean, Detroit and green Bay always play each other rough, but I just, there's no way I see back-to-back -back losses at Lambeau. Sounds like a plan. And yeah, that that was one of the ones I was looking at too, where it's like, it's hard. I have a hard time saying they'll lose two in a row at home. But like I said, it would be a great win if they get that one down, because I do think they're really their manhood. You know, as much as we use that cliche in football, I think their manhood to a man is going to be tested. And it would be great to see them pull that one out. And then the next week, the Packers get to go to Vegas. <laughs> And I have this one chalked up with the win. My explanation for that one is pretty simple. Outside of Max Crosby on the defensive side of the line, Las Vegas has just too many questions on both lines of scrimmage. And that's why I think this one is going to be a win for Green Bay. I think Green Bay has advantages um, both on the offensive line and on their defensive front. I put this one as a loss just because this is going to be one of those games where everybody's going to go into it like, oh, yeah, they're going to win it. They're going to win it. And Green Bay, no matter who the quarterback is, always does that. You know, they, they'll go in as the big, uh, the 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 top dog, and then they get their ass handed to them. So, I, I mean, they still have Devontae. They still have Jacobs. They still have Max Crosby. They still have players out there that are going to be solid. It's going to be fun watching Devontae and Jair match up. I, I don't think Garoppolo is going to be much of anything. I can't think of who the other quarterback is for uh, the Raiders right now. Um, but I just, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I Again, this was another one I kind of flip-flop back and forth on, but I think this could just be something where, Packers maybe go in there a little bit confident after coming off of two wins and, you know, the Raiders will smack them back down. Yeah, it definitely could be one of those where, especially, like I said, Detroit is a, you know, they're, they're a rough and tough team kind of thing. 
and um, you know, it could be a little bit of attrition. What I did forget to mention, so week four is the Thursday night game. And then this um this week five game against the Raiders, it's a Monday night game, which honestly is how the league should approach um the Thursday night games every week, is that team should get a Monday night game the following week. So that's a good thing because Green Bay is going to have to travel for this one, and they might be a little bit banged up because of the knee bite, the kneecap biters the week before. But um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting contrast of um, of of uh, roster philosophies in that sense. Because, like I said, I think Green Bay just has such an advantage in both trenches, but the Raiders definitely do have skill positions, especially on offense. You know, Jacobs was back and um, he's going to, you know, he was a problem even with the Raiders kind of um, duct taped O-line back in 2019. And Devontae is, you know, Jair might win his fair share of snaps, but expecting him to shut down Devontae for a whole game is, I, I would be impressed if he does, but that's a big ask of any corner in any era kind of thing. So, um, you know, Devontae is going to get his at some point. I expect him to have something like a, you know, like a four catch 70 yard with a touchdown or two kind of day, just because that's he, you know, that's the kind of respect you have to give to Tay at this point. And well, you know, they keep saying Jalen Ramsey is the number one corner in the league and Devonte has made him look silly on multiple occasions so yeah you know it, it, the only way that Devonte doesn't have a decent game is if the quarterback play is just absolute shit so to answer your point so um brian hoyer is the first backup and former purdue quarterback aiden o'connell is qb3 as listed right now although and i, I guess, think o'connell had a pretty good preseason he did I have I a good right. preseason yeah so the I guess the biggest question for this game is going to be, is Garoppolo going to make it to week five, honestly? Yeah, yeah. That that would be kind of the, like I said, hard to tell at this point because we're looking at the schedule in a preview, but that, that would be kind of the big question for this game uh, from a opponent's point of view. Um, and then week six goes into the Packers bye, kind of a early bye, but honestly... I'm okay with it this year. The team doesn't really have, you know, big playoff aspirations. So it's not the whole, the whole, uh, the whole like, oh, you want it later in the year. So guys are kind of getting healthier for the stretch run. I think having it a little earlier would just kind of help Love and LaFleur to get on the same page, you know, see what some of the teams are doing to them and kind of project out and maybe make some early adjustments and things like that. And I think it'll be a win. <laughs> got it on the bingo card <laughs> and then week seven they go to sunday night they sunday night football and they go to denver oh no not sunday night football sorry um oh no it is sunday night football I'm looking at hawaii time and stuff but um they're going to denver i have this one as a win i i don't know this one i waffled to I just don't think it's going to be all sunshines and roses for the Peyton Russ Wilson combination. Um, Denver's lost a lot of weapons to injury and it, I think they're all longer term ones. Um, I don't know what Judy's injury, but I know that Tim Patrick's out again. Um, their defense is going to be good. So that'll be an interesting one. And of course the question of, how does a love play at elevation? I know, I know that um, Kansas City st- Stadium is at elevation, but it's not necessarily mile high. So that's kind of the big questions that I've got for this game. Looking at it from a ten thousand foot view, I don't know if that'll bother him too much. I I would think that him playing at Utah State probably played in Colorado a few different times, so it it might be. But I, I, I put this one as a loss just because I, I put it more as a loss as a random loss. Knowing the Packers, Russell Wilson will walk all over them and, and you know, Sean Payton will draw up something. And it, it just – I this is one of those that I just think it will boil down to the – Everything will go wrong for the Packers and everything will go right for Denver. And it, it it's nothing big, nothing major. It just, it, you know, whether it be the re- the penalties will be too high for the Packers or, you know, the receivers are just dropping everything or whatever. It just, I, I think this will be 
we'll call it the bad luck game. I can see that. Yeah. It, like I said, that is where in terms of football, football, I'm feeling good about this one, but yeah, it, it playing in mile high, it always does have those skeletons in the closet kind of thing. And especially against you add the rust factor, you add Peyton, it does kind of magnify those, those uh, skeletons in the closet. Week eight, Minnesota. We both have this one as a win. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think there's much to talk about on there. <laughs> we know what Minnesota is. We know what the Packers are. And I, I don't think that the Vikings are going to beat the Packers at Lambeau. Yeah, same. Then the following the week, it's uh, the Rams. We're split on this one. Joe, you got this. What's What's giving you doubts about this one? Again, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but this is another one I kind of flip-flopped on, kind of waffled around with just because I I, I think it's the Matthew Stafford factor. And, you know, Matt LaFleur has done pretty good against uh, Sean McVay Rams team that I think it just it, it's time to the you know, maybe this time McVay is going to get the upper hand on it. Uh, it's not really anything big, you know, the Rams are going to Ram. They have a good, a good core of players. You know, obviously the question is, is Cooper cup going to be healthy? Is Stafford going to be healthy? How is their line going to hold up? How's the defense going to play? But I, the only thing I hope for is to see Elton Jenkins choke slam Aaron Donald and, uh, that, like I said, that's really about it. I, I know the Rams are kind of on a downhill slide right now because of, uh, because they're losing. You know, they've lost a decent amount of players, but they've also picked up a decent amount of players. I think the cap hell is finally starting to hit them a little bit. But like I said, it, I, I think this is just again kind of why, like with the Raiders game, I think this is just going to end up where the Packers might go in a little bit more confident than they should be. And McVay will finally uh, win the chess match against the floor. I can see that, but yeah, that's the, my whole thing was, um, I think LA has just lost so many things. And the, the other side of it too, is Stafford's coming off of an arm injury and, I don't think he's played this preseason, so I don't know what he's looking like in terms of his throwing this season. So, and Cooper Cup's already hurt. So, right, <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. The, like you said, they still have names on their roster, and Aaron Donald is, you know, I know Elton's handled him, but that was pre ACL and stuff. So we'll see how how that how that battle comes again a, a fourth time around, I guess, at this point. Week after that, week 10, Green Bay goes to Pittsburgh. I have this one at a loss. Um, Hines, or I guess it's Akersher, but it's Hines Field to me. That one has always given Green Bay problems. It's a nightmare for kickers to kick in, so that draws that side of it into question. Um, and Pittsburgh pass rush might be the best pass rush on the on Green Bay's schedule, so it'll be a really good test for that O-line, and I just think that Pittsburgh has enough weapons on offense to um, hang around with Green Bay. And I think if it comes down to it at the end, their kicker is a better kicker. Uh, to, and he's obviously at home in Hein or Akersher. So he'll be used to it. And we have Anders trying to, like you said, keep his marbles in his head and deal with the wins that come into that stadium. So that's why I have this one chalked up as a loss. I put a win... I, I don't think Kenny Pickett's going to be able to do enough to to beat the Packers because, yeah, the Steelers' pass rush is is the toughest one the Packers are going to face. But then on the flip side, the Packers' pass rush is going to be enough to damage, you know, not damage, but to take down Kenny Pickett. Because really, I, I don't think – Pittsburgh offensive line is really going to be that great. 
uh and Pickett is in year two yeah he's got pickens and they seem to be having a really great uh connection going on right now but you know as long as everybody on the defense is healthy at this point you know preston smith hopefully by this time rashawn's off his pitch count and he's back to full bore then you add in Kingsley and then you add in uh, uh, Lucas and Brenton and Justin Hollins. And then you got your guys on the D line. I just, I, I think it's going to be way too much for Kenny Pickett. And, you know, we'll see what happens with the Pittsburgh's run game. But yeah, I just, I, I don't see them. If it, it it's going to be one of those games where it's either the Packers are going to win big, or it's going to be close and Pittsburgh somehow squeaks it out. Yeah, that's that. I think that's the divide for the both of us is, and I understand where you're coming from. This is a game where, it's, like I said, especially if Love and the offense is clicking, they could just dominate the game, kind of thing, and not so much necessarily because they're just gonna, you know take deep shots on Pittsburgh's defense from the opening kick. But if the offense is in rhythm and the defense is taking care of business, you know, t- t- you know, holding down Pittsburgh's offense, it could just be a war of attrition that Green Bay is, you know, it's it's going to end up like a two or three score game kind of thing. And then um, Pittsburgh's not going to, you know, the, the things that I was worried about aren't going to be factors as much as they were kind of thing and stuff. So that's definitely a good point to make. Week 11, it's the Chargers. <laughs> Doesn't look like either of us have a lot of hopes for this one. Yeah, Joe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of waffled on this one a little bit too. But yeah, the Chargers are a tough team. I was just looking at their their schedule here. Did they only play two preseason games? Uh, hold on. Great radio. <laughs> hold on a sec. No, they played played three. Okay, they just didn't have the other one listed. Uh, Yeah, I just... They've got the weapons. They've got a young upstart quarterback who's looking pretty good, which is funny because I think during that draft season, everybody was like poo-pooing the Herbert pick. And it's funny that now he's being talked about as one of the better quarterbacks out of that draft class and i just i don't know they, they've got a lot of guys I, I think another i think this must be the year of the offensive line because wasn't the chargers biggest knock offensive line for them also well last year they had a lot of injury and that's that's really the the biggest thing for the Chargers and it seems like it has been for their existence is how healthy are they going to be at this point of the season? Cause uh, you know, if on paper, their O line should be pretty good. They have Rashawn Slater at left tackle Zion Johnson, I think is going to be playing next to him at left guard old green Bay buddy. Corey Lindsley is still playing really well at center. And then um, they have, their right tackle situation is sorted out. They just were dealing, both their tackles were injured at different points last season. I don't think Slater played past week two. And then Trey Pipkins, their right tackle, he was playing with like a bad knee and a bad groin or something like that for, he was doing the Brian Bulaga. He was playing hurt the whole year kind of thing and stuff. So on paper, it's supposed to be a good O-line. They have weapons, you know, on they have all three levels of weapon weaponry on offense covered. They've got a deep threat. They've got uh, Eckler as their running back, and they've got Keenan Allen to work the intermediate zones. Um, and they do have the kind of deal. The question for them is, are they going to be able to stop the run? And that's where I think Green Bay could give them trouble. Um, but this is one where I do think that Green Bay's safety questions are going to be an issue because they have enough good receivers that, um, you know, they could be challenging, um, not just Jair kind of thing. You know, Jair can only cover one of Mike Williams and Keenan Allen kind of thing. And the rest of it is up to, you know, Razul staying on coverage and the safeties not leaking anyone downfield and stuff. And that's kind of where my question marks for this game was. Yeah, and I was just looking. I forgot they're the ones that picked up uh, Khalil Mack. 
So yep. you've got both Mac and Bosa uh, coming down. So if you know Khalil Mac goes back to form, then that's going to be a formidable duo. So that that could be a a real test for the offensive line. So yeah, I just I, I don't have a ton of hope for this game, but you know, growing pains. You got to yep. take your wins with your loss, your losses with your wins. Yeah, and like I said, the the big question mark for this game is what will both of these teams look like by the time they get to week 11 because like I said that's been that's been the Chargers sad music for the past decade is good team on paper but decimated by injuries at all the wrong times of the year so that'll be an interesting one to watch in the weeks leading up to this game week 12 at Detroit um, we're split on this one same way we were uh, back for the week four game want to see love like I said this is one that I went either way on um, a little bit more towards a loss than I was with the week four game, just because it is the road game um, and need to see love perform on the road. Um, But Joe's got this one as a win. (laughs) I just, I think this will be the year that the Packers finally get back to, you know, winning both games against Detroit. Hopefully by this time in the season, everybody's on the same page you know, the growing pains are, you know, not as prevalent as they were earlier in the season. And it'll be indoors in the winter. And so it just, I, I really think that it, they have a better shot at winning it this year than they have in the past. Maybe we'll see a, a Aaron Rodgers-esque Hail Mary from Love to win the game or something. That would be perfect. But yeah, I, I don't think they're going to lose both games to Detroit this year. Yep, it it'll be a like I said, it's going to be a manhood test, and I I am very interested to see how Green Bay comes out of those two games. Week thirteen, both got it chalked up as a loss, like you said, growing pains. But it'll be a good measuring stick for Love against Kansas City a second time around, and um, he'll be at home this time, but um. Kansas City is as good as advertised, but like I said, it'll be really interesting to see him measure up against Mahomes. I know they don't play on the field at the same time, but um, it, it'll just be a good measuring stick game for the Packers and Love as a whole. I almost went with, uh, went with a win for this one, just because I, I'm I'm in that hope that, again, by this time in the season, everybody's clicking you know, the pass rush is going to be there. The defense is doing well. They hopefully got something figured out in the back end with safety, whether it's they brought somebody in or the guys that we have on roster are really starting to pick things up. But in the end, I just, I don't know. Which is weird to say because, you know, the last, the, the first start Jordan Love ever had, he almost beat the, the Kansas city chiefs granted there was a lot of, you know, issues there with that game, but I just, I I put it as a loss because if you look at it on paper, then yeah, it would be a loss, but you know, it's the old cliche, any given Sunday, anything can happen. But I I just put down loss because we're getting to the point where it's going to be harder to predict what's going on right yeah we're we're looking at this from like a season hasn't started angle and as you've made a great point joe a number of times that hopefully you know we're hoping that the team is just making incremental progress as the season goes and that would change how we look at these games you know going in and out you know it's it's different to look at it, you know, going into that week thirteen game. It's different to look at it as a you know a team that's seven and seven and four at that point versus a team that's you know four and seven kind of thing and stuff. So it'll be kind of interesting to see where where the cards are at at that point and how how the deck looks to be stacked going into that game. Um, but as it stands, it's hard to pick against the the super the reigning Super Bowl champs. Week fourteen, we are again split. We're at New York. It's a Monday night game. Um, Joe, what's giving you pause on this one? 
kind of like the Raiders game where this will be another one where they go in thinking, oh, yeah, we should be able to dominate. And kind of like last year's game in London where, oh, yeah, we should be able to beat them. We shouldn't have any problem. They're down to this, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we pretty much got our ass handed to us. So it, it it's kind of the same boat where, oh, well, you know, Daniel, Daniel Jones isn't really that great. Their weapons really aren't that great you know blah 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 and but then somehow they still pull out a win so i and you know we're getting to now in that schedule we're getting to the point of year with as young of rosters we have you're going to start getting some fatigue from some guys because i i've mentioned this before when we were when nick and i were doing our draft preview the college and the NFL seasons are completely different boats. You know, the, what is it with the college season? They only play like 12 games or something like that, where the NFL, they're playing 17 games. And it just, you know, until somebody gets used to it, they're still good. Their body is still built to, play that college season their first year or two in the league. So you're going to start getting some fatigue. You're going to get some, you know, guys that are just not producing like they were. And this will probably be one of the first games where you're going to start seeing that. Yeah, that's definitely a good point to bring up. Um, That's where it does help that um, there's a lot of youth, like you said, and yeah, there's, they're leaning on a lot of, rookies to play not necessarily big roles but important reserve roles at the very least kind of thing and stuff the the interesting one will be yeah what is the tight end room going to look like at that point of the season or you know is Musgrave hitting a wall from getting targeted 40 gazillion times in the first month of the season is Kraft turning a corner you know are those are those flip flop is Musgrave looking like the second coming and is craft loss kind of thing, or are they both on an upward? Are they both hitting the wall kind of thing? That's the position where, because everywhere else on the roster, there's a lot of veterans, you know, the O line, the running backs, I guess with the running backs, it's more health at that point. Um, So, but it is a good point in terms of the young receiving options. Are they still looking so, you know, young and spry or is or have they hit the 12 game wall, as you said, like you like you noted, because the Kansas City game will be the 12 game wall. You know, that'll be where their college seasons would have ended for all intents and purposes. And even if they made a bowl game, they wouldn't be playing for another month. So it'll be really interesting turning point going into that New York game. I have it as a win for a lot of the reasons you noted. I just think Green Bay has even at this point, a better roster than New York does. Little concern with it being a road game, but I just think that I'm expecting both sides of the ball to be relatively well-oiled machines at that point, and they're going to be able to just kind of push New York around. Um, But I wouldn't be surprised also if they kind of just, you know, wet the bed kind of thing, because it is is coming off playing the reigning Super Bowl champs you're always kind of opening yourself up for that kind of game. So definitely um, one of those where they'll have to go in with um, both eyes forward. And then the week after that, Tampa Bay. um, I'm just looking at this one as a potential loss because I don't know if we're going to score enough against Tampa Bay to win that game. Um, It'll be another good measuring test game for love and the offense because this Tampa Bay defense has given Green Bay trouble for the past three seasons. And I'm really curious to see what they're going to look like with love on their center. Maybe um, being reinvigorated with more of LaFleur's offensive uh, schemes and tendencies is going to help loosen up what Tampa Bay likes to do on defense, but it'll be a good measuring stick one in my book. I put win because if it's Baker Mayfield, starting Baker's going to throw another gajillion interceptions and and I this isn't the same Tom Brady led Tampa Bay team so I just I I don't see it as a big scary you know game and it's at home again so I just I yeah 
I mean, I, it, kind of going back to what I said with the Giants, it's going to depend on what the team is looking at at this point. Are they dropped off? Are they, you know, whatever. But, you know, I, I just I don't think Tampa is going to win. And like you said, that's at the point of the season where is Baker even going to be the starter at that point? So, yeah, yeah, it, yeah that could definitely be. Week after that, they're at Carolina. We've both got this one as a win. Um, there's a lot of reasons for Carolina to be excited, um, but I think they have too many questions on their O-line, and honestly, I don't know who's on their defense at this point in time, and I just think that Green Bay has advantages on both sides of the line of scrimmage in this game, and I think that that one's going to play out. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I have this one looking. I think Bryce Love or Bryce Young is a is not going to be very good, and the only thing that hurts me about the Carolina game is they got my boy Jonathan Mingo, and you know I don't want to see him not be good, but I just I don't see Bryce Young being much of anything. It kind of surprised me that they went with him as the number one overall pick, but I guess that's what everybody. That's what the talking heads thought, but he sure as a hell did not look good in the preseason. And who knows? We're going to be in that part of the season where anything can happen. I just, I know. I hope for a big game in a way for Mingo, but I just don't see uh, seeing them come out with the win. Yeah. And like I said, their old line is just, it has too many holes. Um, the, the, the clips I've seen of Bryce Young in the preseason – they're all like he's just running for his life and making a throw kind of thing. So I, I get the feeling that's what it's going to look like at that point of the season. Week 17 at Minnesota. I have this one as a coin flip game. We didn't project what the other team's records are going to be, but I have it shaded as a loss because if Minnesota's pushing for a playoff spot, they might play desperate. But Honestly, Joe, I, I don't disagree hard with you marking this one as a win, kind of what we were saying earlier in the season. I won't see them lose to Minnesota twice. I will not let it happen. <laughs> I I will not let it happen. Uh, yeah. I'm so I, I'm more up. chalking this one up as like a road law. It's a, you know, we, we always, Green Bay always struggles on the road in Minnesota, but that's, I'm hanging this pick more on that than, the team that Minnesota actually has kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, they're even in big question marks on a lot of their stuff. They seem like they're in a kind of a rebuild right now too. Uh, but I just, no, I won't let the Packers lose another <laughs> twice. And as I am laughing about that, we are also laughing about week 18. It is the closeout game for the season against Chicago and I guess the only thing that I would point to this game is if Green Bay has the kind of upper, you know, the upper ceiling season that Joe and I were talking about, you know, they could be playing to lock up the division, lock up a wild card, lock up seeding, perhaps, you know, depending on how uh, the NFC stacks up this season. It, you know, that's the only kind of pressure I could see really being on love in this game because I, I think we're both in the same boat that who knows if Fields is even starting at this point, whether it's because of performance, injury, whatever kind of thing. But um, I, I just get the feeling that Green Bay is just going to run Chicago off of Lambeau <laughs> at this point. And it's just a question of what is each team playing for at that point in time. It's the Bears. <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to say the same things that I said for the first game. Bri uh, Bryce, uh, Justin Fields is a glorified running back. Their wide uh, yeah, DJ Moore is a tremendous talent, but their receivers don't really scare me. Their offensive line, they're already dealing with injuries early on in the season. Who knows what's going to happen later in the season. Their defense doesn't really scare me either. So uh, the only way the Packers lose is if they're beating themselves. So, yeah, the, I don't have much more to add to that. I just – i they're not going to lose it. I, I won't – again, I will not allow them to lose it. <laughs> Heads will be slapped. <laughs> but, yep. That concludes our our our, our 
preview of this upcoming 2023 season. Like we said, our record, the, the records we've put forth, there is a lot of variables and it'll be an interesting one to go through on a week by week basis because I do think there's going to be a lot of expectation resetting this season. You know, everyone's going in with a, you know, I don't want to say high hopes, but, you know, it. there's a good outlook on the season because the NFC North is relatively trash. The rest of the NFC, you know, the South, the NFC South is, you know, we're playing the NFC South and it's relatively a garbage fire. And the teams in the NFC West and the East, they have to play each other six times. So there's, a, you know, if, if, if Green Bay has a Minnesota, you know, the season Minnesota had in 2022 where the ball just seems to bounce their way, Green Bay could be playing for the two seed at the end of the season just because of strength of schedule, who you know, who's on everybody's schedule, who has to you know cross matches and things like that. And um they could be setting themselves up for a nice run. Like you said, Joe, if the offense is, you know, clicking in rhythm, if the defense shows the strides it made this season and or in this preseason, and if the safety room has, you know, clarified itself by mid, you know, by the bye week, even, you know, that'd be probably a little early. But you know, if going into the Denver game, if Anthony Johnson has kind of asserted himself as one of the starting, you know, hopefully the starter opposite Savage, it's like, okay, you've got your two probably most athletic safeties on the field, and you kind of let Johnson just at that point grow into the position. Who knows? You know, it's, it's going to be kept on how the team coalesce over the season and what love does at the quarterback position. And who knows the Packers could be a little bit more active at the trade deadline this year than they have in the past. So, you know, there could still be some maneuvers that happen that, you know, really help out the team before the deadline. So it's early. I, I know we're all pumped for it. And, and, you know, the season technically starts in, you know what a week and a half so it i guess a week because the kickoff game is thursday night yeah yeah so yeah about a week and that's when things will really get rolling yep yeah it's i think like you said the excitement for it is we don't know for the first time in 15 years we don't know what this team is going to look like you know we we've, we've got clues of it from the preseason We've, we're both on record as saying we like a, the majority of what we saw from Love, and it's just a matter of, you know, he's a first-time starter. There's certain mistakes he's going to make early in the season. You know, he he can make a couple of them against the Bears in Week One. He can't be making the same ones against right. them in Week 18, and that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the biggest measure of how successful this season is, to, in my eyes, because to me, they're not a Super Bowl contender. But as long as Love is showing that he has game breaker game tilter potential and he's you know checking off boxes as the season goes that's a successful season to me yeah that that sounds good to me i i mean we we can just beat a dead horse with it it just <laughs> because until they start playing games we'll never we won't know officially what's going to happen all right joe any final thoughts for our our listeners um heading into the season any final words of wisdom? No, I, you know, just, I, I guess my thing is, is don't be a troll. You know, we know there's going to be ups and downs with the season, but don't be this uh, pessimistic, you know, person. You know, we're going to have growing pains. Don't be the wishy-washy. Oh, well, we should have kept Rogers and shipped out love or we should have done this just let it ride. You know, this is the find out year. This is the find out how this team's going to handle things. We knew we were going to lose Rogers at some point. They just made it happen a little earlier than what some of us expected, but just let it go. Let, let, let them play. If they do well, be excited. If they don't do well, hope that they fix it next year. Yep. I think that's good words of wisdom to live by this season. But thank you for joining us on this week's edition of the Ohana Packers Edition podcast. You can find us on Twitter. I'm at Kawano Mike and Joe at Iowa underscore Joe 86. Find the show at Ohana underscore Packers. 
New episodes drop every Tuesday. Please make sure to give us a like and a subscribe and give us a like if you enjoy what you hear. Also, please leave us a review. Wishing you all a happy week one kickoff. Go Pack Go and aloha. Aloha.